We're in week number four of our series, How to Be Rich. And I know a lot of times you hear someone go, oh, how to be rich. Junk, they're talking about money in the church. This is awkward, right? But I'm going to tell you how to get rich. Everybody's telling you how to get rich, right? Everywhere you go, all the emails, all the commercials, all the everything, how to get rich. But this week, we want to talk about how to be rich. This is our fourth week in the series. We're going to close it out. Perfect week to be here because you get to hear all of it kind of wrapped up in a nice little package for you to go forward with. And we've been in this uh, passage of scripture from the book of 1 Timothy chapter 6. If you pull out your notes, it's right there at the top of your notes. They're going to come up on the screens as well. Um, and, and God has some very specific things to say to people who are rich. In fact, the very first line of this section says this, command those who are rich in this present world. We'll put a pause there, a dot, dot, dot. Command those who are rich in this present world. Now, if you don't think you're rich, are you going to read the rest of this and apply it to your life? You can answer me. Uh, we're talking. It's a conversation. If you don't think you're rich, are you going to apply this to your life? No, because you don't think you're rich. And God's talking to rich people. And I'm not rich. I mean, I don't feel rich, right? And there's the problem. Rich is a moving target, isn't it? So many times we go, well, I'm not rich. That person's rich. And that person's going, I'm not rich. That person's rich. And it just stair steps all the way up. Well, the first realization, I've got four realizations we need to come to this morning. Uh, for when it comes to how to be rich in a godly way, kind of what God says about being rich, how to be rich. Uh, the first realization we need to come to, number one in your notes, is this. I am rich. I am rich. That's, you got to kind of fill that in. I am rich. And I want you guys to say it with me on the count of three. One, two, three. I am rich. That was a little weaker than I was hoping for. I got to be completely honest with you. Because I don't think you guys believe you're rich, okay? So we're going to say it again. All right, one, two, three. I am rich. Now, this is not a I am rich, I am prosperous, I gave to God, now he's going to give to me, I am rich. This is God has already made me rich. God has already taken care of my needs. I may be facing some financial stress right now, but if I look at the world around me, I'm rich. And in fact, if you look at the worldwide standard of what is rich and what is not rich, we're, we're the one percenters of the world. If you make the U.S. average a $52,000 a year household income, you're the top 1% in the world. You are rich, aren't you? But none of you turned to your wife or your husband or your girlfriend or boyfriend or whoever's sitting next to you and went, I'm rich. I made it. Yes. Fine. I've been waiting for this day. You didn't, you didn't react that way because you don't feel rich. Because here's the problem. Rich is a moving target, isn't it? Every time you get a little bit and you feel like you're ahead, what happens? Something happens. And you're like, oh, man. College, kid broke their arm, car went broken, or whatever, all these things. You're like, oh man, I don't feel rich. But if we look at the reality of our situation, we are genuinely rich. And here's some, I got some rich people problems. If you have one of these problems, you're rich, okay? All right, check this out. It's, it's supposed to be funny, so I want you to laugh uh, with me, okay? Uh, actually, I have family in town, so can you guys be on your best behavior and laugh with me? Can you do that? Okay, good. All right, so uh, here, here's some signs you know you're rich, okay? Uh, one of your air conditioners goes out. Think about that. You have air conditioning? And one of them went out? Yeah, I'm mad, it went out. I have to call the repairman. He can't be here next week. Ugh. Like rich people problems, right? You know what I'm talking about? You ever been there? Okay. Or one of your bathrooms isn't. You have a bathroom in your house? I don't have to like walk down the street? No, it is. it's right there. Wow, you must be rich, right? Think about that. You're not laughing very much. It's, you're doing a terrible job. I just got to tell you that. <laughs> ah, I only get two weeks of vacation. Err, grr. 14 days where they're going to pay me to do nothing. Ah, it's awful. Right? Child care. I have to pay. Child care is so expensive. What? People will watch your kids for you? That's incredible, right? Here's, here's a real hot button one. Health care. Oh, no laughs there. Okay. I got you. Insurance. Err, ah, right? Most of the world has, does, doesn't even have access to a doctor, and we're arguing about it, right? Like, think about that. Who's rich? I think we're rich. We're doing all right. Um, uh, watering bans. Hey, like, you can't water your lawn at certain times a day. Like, think about that. You're, you're spraying drinking water on your yard, and you're mad that you can only do it on Tuesdays and Thursdays. How rich? Like, people have to walk four miles to get river water, and we're spraying into the dirt water that's cleaner than they'll ever see. Rich people 
problems, and this is my favorite one, storage units. <laughs> Think about it. Oh, my house. My house, it's like, it's so full of stuff. I know, I'll fill the garage, because the garage is like a house for the car. People don't have houses, but we have a house for our car, and we, and we jam all of our Christmas decorations and all of our extra things and our bikes that the kids grew out of and all the, the lawn equipment and stuff after stuff. And then, we, and, and then your wife's like, where do we put this? And you're like, I don't know. It, let's put it in the garage. Oh, the garage is full. I have an idea. Let's rent space for all this stuff that we're not going to use and put it over there, and then we don't have to see it. It's gone. It's rich people problems. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, I'm paying monthly to store my stuff that I never want to see again. In a, think about that. Are we rich or are we rich? We're rich. We, we, I am rich. I don't have a storage unit, but I've got a garage that I can't park my car in. Right? <laughs> you guys, are you there? Or you can barely wedge the car in. If the kid took their bike for a ride, you can get your car in there, right? Think about that. We are really, really rich. That's the first realization we need to come to. The second realization is this. You want to go to your notes? It says, this is a long one, okay? Don't trust in riches, but in the one who richly provides. Don't trust in riches, but in the one that richly provides. We have uh, this tendency to lean into our riches. So God has blessed us. Uh, we live in North America. Uh, we are the top 1% uh, income earners in the world. And here's our tendency. We've got all this money, and we, and we lean into the money. We trust the money more than we try to trust in God. And, 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 you, and it's like money has its own gravitational pull. Like it sucks us in. It's kind of like, ladies, uh, you might understand this a little better than the guys. It's like there's a shoe store, and they've got like the 50% off rack, right? And what do you do? You go in the store, and what's, where's, where are you going to gravitate towards, right? There's like this subtle pull that kind of like, I've seen it in action. I'm married, okay? Even my daughters, they're like, Daddy, look at the red sign, S-A-L-E, or, or BOGO, buy one, get one, that's dangerous. And all the girls are like, yeah, have you seen one of those? I'd like to go over there too. And, and, and like, it's got its own gravitational pull. That's what money does to us. And while, husbands, while your wife is looking at all these shoes, what are you doing? Uh, until you see the Harbor Freight sign. Oh, yeah. That's my, it's like, it's like, everything is such a good deal here. I don't need any of it. My garage is already full, but man, look at this thing of Medusa what's or I really need this, right? But it, like, you know what I'm talking about? Money has that pull on us, though, just like that. It pulls on us. It, it kind of gets us going in one direction. But the verse that we're reading in 1 Timothy chapter 6 says, hey, hey, those of you who are money, he says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant. I don't even have time to go there, but you know there's a connection between money and arrogance, right? You've seen the prideful people that they're like, I have money, so I'm a better person. Okay, I'm not even going to go there. Okay, but then he says this, not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth. Don't lean into, don't trust in wealth, uh, which is so uncertain. Then he says, but... But do this, but put your hope in God. Don't lean, don't trust that way, don't hope that way, but lean that back over to God. Is he saying don't have money? No, 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 he's not saying don't have money. He's saying don't trust money. Don't let that be your security. Let God be your security. So he says lean into God, the one who richly provides everything for our enjoyment. So he says don't lean into money, lean into God. Don't trust in your riches. Trust in the one who richly provides. Don't trust in the gifts, but trust in the giver who gave those gifts. And so that, uh, that's our second realization. Don't trust in riches, but in the one who richly provides. Third realization is this. Check it out right in your notes. Uh, since we have more, do more and give more. Since we have more, do more and give more. And I'm giving you some long blanks. I know that. You guys like, I, I hear pens clicking and heads going down. That's cool. Right, right, right. Since we have more, do more and give more. Uh, let's go back to like fifth grade science class real quick, okay? Uh, you guys know what simple tools are? You ever hear that? There's like the inclined plane. Uh, there's the screw. But then there's the lever, right? You, ever, you guys know what the lever is? Like you have a fulcrum and you have like a big stick and you're trying to lift something that's heavier. And the longer the stick, the more weight you can lift with one person. It's called a lever. Well, God's saying the same thing uh, in this verse. He, he continues. He says, okay, everything is provided for your enjoyment. And then he says this, command them, which is, this is kind of a strong word, command them to do good. 
to be rich in good deeds and to be generous and willing to share. He goes, okay, rich people, listen up. I've, I've got a plan for you. This, this, is, this is how you be good at being rich. We know people who are bad at being rich, right? <laughs> if I was rich, I would do something totally different than that, right? He's saying this is how you be good at being rich. He goes, be rich in good deeds. Don't be average in good deeds. Be rich in good deeds. Think about it like this. God gave an average person an average amount of wealth to do an average amount of leverage, right? Like, but God gave us a longer stick. He, he, some of us have a longer uh, leverage. We have more wealth than someone else. And the more wealth we have, the more leverage we have to make a difference in the world around us. And God said to you, hey, 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 look at this. Be rich in good deeds. The, the measure that he's given us is the measure of responsibility he wants us to take with our wealth. So he goes, hey, hey, you over there gave you a big stick. I want you to do a lot. I'm the one who made you rich because that's what we believe as Christians. Like God is the provider of everything. And he goes, I've provided you with more, so I want you to do more with it. Does that mean you have to give it all away? No, no, no. God has never worked on uh, poverty. He's always worked on percentage. Does that make sense? Like, Everyone sacrifices the same amount, percentage, right? We don't equally give, but he says, I want you to use your leverage for the same percentage. If you've got a big lever, I want it to be equal. I want it to be proportionate. And that sounds good in theory, doesn't it? Do good deeds. Be rich in good deeds because you're rich. But the actual fact is the more money we make, the less percentage-wise we give. The more uh, time we have, the less time we actually give. Does that... It doesn't make sense, but that's what happens. The, the, the longer our, our leverage is in life, the less we actually use it for good. We use it more on ourselves than anything else, the more money we make. And so God's saying here, he goes, I know this is a, a tendency. I know this is how we do things. So he goes, do good. Be rich in good deeds. Use your leverage to, to make a big difference in life. And then finally, the fourth re, uh, uh, realization is this the fourth revelation that we need to come to to be good at being uh, wealthy the way God has intended us to be is this, is there is more to this life than this life. There's more to life than this life. You guys, TJ, that one doesn't make sense, does it? Okay. There's more to life than this life. There's more than today than today. Uh, Paul continues this letter to Timothy, and this whole thing that Paul's writing is a letter to a young pastor named Timothy. Now, Paul used to be rich. He knows the temptations. He knows the struggles. He knows the ups and downs. And then he lost all of his riches when he became a follower of Jesus. And, and he's saying to Timothy, watch out. These rich people are going to have these issues. And the final one, and we're continuing it in verse 19 of 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 19, he says this, in this way, you will lay up for yourselves treasure. You'll lay up treasure for yourselves as a firm foundation. Let's pause on that for a second. In this way, what the heck is he talking about? He's saying, when you do this, when you do good, when you are rich in good deeds, when you, when you have all of the other res, uh, realizations, the first three, when you do all of those things, when you do this, you're, something's going to happen. When you, when you do good, when you're rich in good deeds, when you're generous, when you're willing to share, when you do those things, here's what's going to happen in return. He says, when you do this, you're going to lay up a firm foundation. You're going to be putting money away. Now, the mathematics on this doesn't make sense whatsoever. What? Okay, so to get money, I have to give money? No, that's not the case. He's saying, he's saying when you share, you're going to lay up for the future. Well, TJ, how does that work? I can't subtract and add at the same time. Well, he's talking about a principle that is so prevalent throughout the entire Bible that Jesus hammers into the, everyone's head time and time again. Uh, that Paul, he doesn't even bother really digging into it. He just goes, okay, this is it. In fact, he just goes on, you'll, you'll have uh, a firm foundation for the coming age. He doesn't even explain it. But we need to go back to the teachings of Jesus to really understand it. And that starts in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. You can read it from the screens or in your notes. And it says this, Do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus is giving us a scenario. He's saying, this life that you have today is not all there is. You can store up a lot of riches here on earth, but the better place to store it is in eternity. 
store it in heaven. And Paul alludes to this. Jesus tells us what we need to do, not to store up on earth, but to store up in heaven. He says, that's what you need to do. Paul tells us how to do it. How do you do that? Well, you do good. Be rich in good deeds. Be generous, willing to share. He says, you can have a, there's a connection between what you do with God's given you now and how life will be in heaven. He says, there's a connection there. And it's a hard connection for us to make because we don't think about it very often, do we? But Jesus, time and time and time and time again, reminds us of that because he knows it's hard for us to remember. He knows that it's hard for us to kind of stay on top of it. And Paul just alludes to it because Jesus is, talks about it so much. So it, this is not a condition of whether if you go to heaven, because heaven is a free gift, amen, thank God, right? But this is how we spend our time in heaven. That's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, hey, lay up treasures in heaven. You can't take it with you, but you can send it ahead of time. Does that make sense? Did, did you, you know what I'm saying? Well, we can stockpile here. In fact, Jesus tells a story of, about a man that was really rich. In, in Luke chapter 12, I'm going to read that for you really quickly with a little commentary. Then he told a story. This is Jesus. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. Now, who made this man rich? Jesus, right? Or God. And he had fine crops. Well, who makes crops grow? Was this man just extraordinarily good at farming? Who gives the sunshine? Who gives the rain? Who provides the soil and the seed? Who makes things grow? God. This man was rich, and the rich got richer. God put him in a position to be successful. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. He said to himself, what should I do? I don't have enough room for all my crops. <laughs> then he said, I know. I'll tear down my barns and get a storage unit. I mean, um, I'll build bigger ones. This is getting personal, isn't it? Okay. Um, I'll build bigger ones. Then I'll have enough room to store all my wheat and other goods. He says, look at this, man. This is awesome. I I've got all this stuff. In fact, I've got too much stuff for my house. I'm going to tear down the barns. I'm going to build something bigger. I I'm going to have something uh, maybe on the water. Yeah, that's what I'll do. Oh, I want to see it. He's, uh, I'm rich. I'm, I'm gonna but here's the problem. Here, look at his attitude. In the next couple of verses, he says this. Uh, and I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have stored all away all for years to come. Now take it easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. It's all about him, right? He's going, oh, look, it's all for me. I've got it set up. I could live to be 200 years old, and I wouldn't run out of stuff. I'd be completely stocked. I'm completely fine. And then Jesus changes the direction of the story, and he goes, but God. Oh, yeah forgot about that guy, the one that made me rich, the one that, that gave me all of this to begin with, uh, to, that, that gave me the, the soil, the land, the, the sun, the rain, the seed, the one that made this crop happen, but God, and God said to him something that's pretty strong, God said to him, you fool, look at this, you, 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 you're rich, but man, you're not making it very far. Uh, you see, he doesn't call him a fool because he is rich. And, and there's, a, there's a lot of evil attached to being rich in our society in North America. Like if you're rich, there's, you, you got there because you're a bad person and you cheated your way to the top and blah, blah. I don't believe that's true. This man was a fool, not because he was rich, but because he forgot God. God's such an integral part of our life. He's the one that gives us all of this. And the, and the, and the guy's going, wait, wait, what? You, my, I'm a fool? And he continues, you will die this very night. Then who will get everything you worked for? And I think that's a rhetorical question, but I'm going to answer it. It's, it's going to be somebody else, right? Because that guy's dead. He ain't got nothing now. His barns, everything, it's all gone. The government owns it now. Think about it. This man, total loss. He saved. He probably went without. He built bigger barns. He kept it all to himself. And all of it was lost when he passed away. And Jesus brings up something pretty important. When you don't connect the way you live life today with the life that is to come, there's a risk that we have a total loss. Every, we'll be in heaven, we'll spend eternity with God, that's good. I think we'll be happy with that. But when we disconnect what we do on earth as a believer with eternity, we don't get to ship anything ahead of time. You know what I'm saying? 
Like, like our stuff is not going before us. But when we store treasures in heaven, oh, there's something different there. And, and Jesus concludes this. He says, yes, a person is a fool to store up wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. The NIV says not to be rich towards God. There's, there's a, a, a direction that our heart will flow. With our money, we can be rich towards ourselves. We can be rich towards God. And God says, hey, I'd like for you to be rich towards me because there's so much, it's, it's, it's life, it's real life. In fact, in the verse in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 19, at the end of that, let's pull it up and put it on the screens. Can we do that? At the end of that verse, he talks about life in 1 Timothy chapter, uh, I'll read it for you, okay? <laughs> he says this, in the same way, they will store up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. And then he says this, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. There's life, there's normal life, there's life, like everyday life, but then there's real life, and that's what God wants us to take hold of. And there's two different ways we can take this. Um, when it comes to this concept, this thought, or principle of there's more to this life than this life, we can go in two directions. One, we've been hitting on already. It's our life. It's our current reality and our future reality, that coming age that Paul alludes to, the, the storing treasures in heaven that Jesus alludes to. But then there's this secondary thing when it comes to the way we live with our finances and our generosity, how we can give to affect somebody else's life. We can store up treasures in heaven by being generous, and that helps us, but it also helps someone else. We can use what we have to leverage for the good of another person. So not only are we affecting our own life, but we're affecting someone else's life. And when we get to the realization that what we do today affects us, in a positive way, and someone else in a positive way, we begin, we begin to experience what Paul is saying, a life that is truly life. So let's dive into that second part, affecting someone else's life. Uh, all of us are affected by someone else's generosity. Did you know that? Think about that. All of us, at some point, are affected by someone else's uh, generosity. Look into the Old Testament of the Bible. Think about it. What if, what if Noah... God's like, Noah, I want you to build a boat. It's going to rain and a flood, and I need you to help me start over. And Noah goes, I don't really do boats. They're just, I can't swim. It's weird, right? He had to make a sacrifice to make that happen. He worked for 120 years on a boat. Come on, he had to get bored at least once, right? But he, he pressed through. He gave of himself. What about um, David. What if he's like, I don't do giants, all right? I do normal-sized people, that's fine, but giants, I don't think I can handle that one. What, what if we go to the New Testament and Mary's like, I don't do virgin birth. I can't do that, nope. No, I don't think that's, I don't think it's going to work, right? What, 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 if, what, if, what if Paul said no to God when he, when his, when he got knocked off his horse? What if, what if, okay, let's go into like more modern, what if Michelangelo's like, I only do walls, not ceilings? You guys are like, I don't get it. It's Sistine Chapel, he painted the roof. Okay, okay, wasn't funny then. Okay, I'll move on from there. All right, what, what, but what if all these people said, no, I don't do this? What, what, if, what if it came down to it when two and a half years ago, we started to gather a launch team to start the shore, and they go, ah, you know what? I don't really do church plants. I don't really do middle schools with weird things hanging on the walls, and I don't, I don't really do, that's not really church. That's not a real, I don't really do that. Where would we be today? What about, what about the serve team that were even here early this morning? Or Friday night helping to set up. What, what if they said, I don't do that? Think about it. We all are affected by generosity. What if Jesus said, I don't do crosses? Everyone is affected by the generosity of someone else. And, and Jesus changes our motivation for giving. Because in the Old Testament, there was a lot of obligation. God says, I want you to do this. But Jesus says, this is your delight. To give is your delight. It's, it's life. It's real, true, honest life. When we are generous, there's this life that comes out of us, and we affect our, our own life, but the lives of so many others. Um, I said earlier that I have family here, and I don't really want to single them out or anything like that. I, I love my family, um, but they were generous before this church even existed. Uh, the first letter I sent out was to friends and family to kind of help us get some financial support so that we could even like rent this place and things like that. And without hesitation, uh, my aunt and uncle sent a check, the first check to come in. I don't think I told them this yet, but that was the, mo the, the first significant check to really come in through the mail was like from them. And they didn't, they didn't believe in me. They believed that there's more to this life than this life, and they're going to affect someone, right? And, and about a year ago, it'll be a year next week, or sorry, two years ago, it'll be two years ago next week, we hadn't started the church yet, 
and we found out that we're $10,000 short of our goals for raising finances. And we're like, what are we going to do? Because for me, $10,000 might as well have been $100,000. I didn't have it, right? And so I, I just made some phone calls. I got around. And, and my grandparents helped us out with, with a significant amount of that. And within two weeks, the ball started rolling and we raised all that money. And, and today, here we are. If, if those two things hadn't happened, guess where I would be right now? Not right here. We're all affected by someone's generosity. And I want to see, uh, I want to I give kind of like a, a practical illustration of this right now. Um, if you're in here this morning and, and you were affected by someone's generosity, they, they either gave to the shore, they worked whatever, and now God has worked in your life through the ministry here at the shore. Uh, you, you've committed your life to Christ. You've recommitted your life to Christ. You, you've met with God. The Holy Spirit has worked inside of you. You've been prompted to do something by God. Something like some kind of interaction between you and God. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to raise your hand real high. Hold it up. Look at that. All these people affected by God. Why? Because the Holy Spirit spoke to someone's heart. Because they were generous. And God used that generosity to affect your life. And you don't even know who these people are. Yet you raised your hand and you said, God did something in me. But it took someone else sacrificing for them to get here. Does that make sense? When we give, when we're generous, when we're really doing, being rich, like God has called us to be rich, we don't affect just our life. We affect so many other lives in such a positive way. God really works inside of us. Now, you may be here this morning and you're going, TJ, this life that is really life, I don't really know what that even means. I don't really get it. I, I'm, you wouldn't qualify yourself necessarily as a Christian. You would just kind of say, I'm kind of checking it out. And you're going, I don't know if I like what I'm checking out. You just, you don't, you don't get it. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, and, and so let's talk a little bit more about that life that God gives. Jesus said in uh, John chapter 10, verse 10, it's not on the screens, it's not in your notes. I just want you to listen to me for a couple seconds. John 10, 10. He says, the thief or the enemy has come to steal, kill, and destroy. Now, each of us, if we look back across our lives, we can see evidence of that, can't we? You got something stolen. There was, there was a, a dream that was killed in your life. There was a relationship that was destroyed. We see evidence of the brokenness of this world, don't we? But Jesus says, the thief has come to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you may have life, and life to the fullest. Real life. Honest life. The kind, of, the kind of life that gives you peace in your heart even when the world is all broken around you. The kind of life that brings you joy right in your heart even though it looks on the outside like steal, kill, and destroy are all that's happening in the world. There's still something inside of you. There's life inside of you that only Jesus can give. And this morning, I know that all of you have experienced that steal, kill, destroy side. But not all of us have experienced the life that only God can give, that only Jesus can give. And this morning, here's what I'd like you to do with me. I'd like you to experience that life with me if you've never experienced it before. And, and it's a really simple thing to do. We just, we have to ask God, fill me with more of you. Forgive me of all the sins that I've committed in the past. Make me new. And there's an exchange, there's a process that happens when we do that. God's gonna, God says, here's what I'm gonna do. You call on my name, you will be saved. Many of you guys wonder what that term means. It just means the old us is gone. We are out of the slavery of sin and we are new. We're made new. He's, it's an exchange that occurs. And when we do that, he says, I'm going to give you real, honest, true life. Give me, give me destruction. Give me death. Give me the stealing. Give me, give me all that. I'll, I'll take that off of you and I want to give you real, true, honest life. And the Bible says, they that call on the name of the Lord will be saved. He says, I will do this if you come to me. And so this morning, here's what I'd like for us to do. I'm going to pray a prayer, and I'm going to pray it as if I'm praying it for me. But I want you guys, I want you guys to, to pray this prayer quietly in your heart. And so if you could, just close your eyes, bow your heads for a moment. And here's what I'd like for us to do. I'm going to pray, say it in your heart, and in this moment, I believe that God's going to do something in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives, real life, honest life, true life. So Father, right now, I pray that you would forgive me of every sin. I've seen the evidence in this world of the brokenness, the hurting, the, the, the steal, the kill, and the destroy, God. But today, I want to experience you. I want to experience the life that only you can give, God. So give me hope, give me peace, give me joy. I give you everything that I am. Thank you, Father. In your name we pray. And everybody says... Amen.